Hitman is not a subtle game. It almost can't be. Yet, it wasn't until the recently released conclusion to the World of Assassination trilogy that I started to realize why it resonated so much with me. So I played through all of it again, then a couple more times, and the more I played, the clearer it became how important that bluntness is to what the game is trying to say. The story in these games has generally taken a back seat for me. It's a convoluted, conspiratorial spy thriller told pretty unevenly across three separate games. Looking at the experience as a whole now that the series is finished gives the plot some much needed cohesion and finally lets me parse why I find it so engaging. Hitman is not a subtle game, but subtlety is overrated. But I like to think no one's untouchable. For the purposes of this essay, I'm only going to be looking at the recently released trilogy of games, confusingly titled Hitman, Hitman 2, and Hitman 3. I'll be ignoring any media from the franchise outside of these three games, mostly for the sake of my own sanity and to keep this video under feature length. This is largely going to be an analysis of the game's story. There are many videos breaking down Hitman from a gameplay perspective, and I'll link a few of my favorites down below if you're interested in that approach as well. All the footage you'll be seeing is from Hitman 3, which contains the contents of the previous games, but the title in the bottom left will refer to whatever game the level originally came from. Firstly, I want to start by summarizing the plot. The plot thickens. You play as Agent 47, genetically engineered super assassin without empathy or compassion, not even having a real name. 47 works for the ICA, a private, shadowy organization that performs assassinations for various clients around the world. This is the first of many shadowy organizations in the world of assassination, so I'll try to make distinctions between them as clear as possible. Your main contact within the ICA is Diana Burnwood. She acts as 47's handler, selecting his contracts and providing intel while he works. This is the basic framework the games use to set up the various globetrotting missions. The game's narrative can be broken into two main strands, one focusing on 47's past and what it might mean for his future, and one focusing on the powerful people who run the world from behind the curtain. Likewise, this video will be split along similar lines, an examination of 47 as a character and what the story says about him, and an examination of his targets and the shadowy organizations behind them. The story begins with 47 and Diana at the top of their game, working for the ICA and carrying out various seemingly unrelated contracts. Towards the end of the first game, it's revealed that a singular shadow client is behind each of these contracts, with each target of the first four levels being members of an organization known as Providence. The discovery of Providence is followed by the reveal that the director of the ICA is trying to become a member, leading to his swift assassination at the hands of 47. It is at this point that Providence reveals themselves properly in the form of their leader, the Constant, who meets with Diana to discuss a future working together. The first half of Hitman 2 follows 47 and Diana taking out various contracts for Providence. These are people who worked with the mysterious Shadow Client who had tried to destroy Providence using the ICA in the first game. Towards the end of Hitman 2, the identity of the Shadow Client is revealed. Lucas Gray, a man who was part of the same program that created 47, a program that was run by Providence. Where 47 had his memory wiped, however, Gray did not, and has been working to bring them down ever since. At this point, Diana and 47 choose to switch sides, working with Gray in an effort to bring down Providence. It's also worth noting that from this point on, they aren't working with the ICA anymore. The three of them manage to kidnap the Constant and discover that the organization is run by the three wealthiest families in the world. They simply pooled their resources and used that combined power to influence the world as they saw fit. The game ends with the reveal that 47 is responsible for the deaths of Diana's parents, an event that was wiped from his memory along with everything else. The Constant escapes and Hitman 3 begins with 47, Diana, and Grey now targeting the various heads of the Providence families, taking them down one at a time. 
While this is happening, however, the Constant is grooming Diana to become his replacement. The second mission ends with the death of Lucas Gray and 47 finding himself alone for the first time. His only remaining ally is the hacker Olivia, who has assisted the team at a few points throughout. They are both being hunted down by a now Providence-controlled ICA, and so the two set out to take down the ICA once and for all. They release all of the ICA's private data on contracts and targets to the public, effectively destroying the organization, but not before scrubbing any mention of 47 and Diana. With the ICA dealt with, all that remains is the constant, Arthur Edwards. At this point, however, 47 and Olivia locate Diana and set out to find her. Diana's plan is to assume the position of Constant and take down Providence from the inside. Just as 47 has finished removing Diana's competition, however, she betrays him, handing him over to Edwards. This was just a ploy to get 47 close to Edwards so he could take him out once and for all. With the Constant dead, Diana assumes control of Providence and begins dismantling the organization piece by piece. The trilogy ends with 47 reaching out to Diana again, presumably beginning their work once more. This is a lot, and I absolutely wouldn't blame you for not following any of it. I certainly didn't the first time through. But I think it's good to have an overview of the characters and their arcs, so when we break them down later, there is an easy reference point. For now, don't worry so much about the details. I should tell you, the trail went dead after Romania. Our team found no records of any kind, no name, nothing. I think they called me 47. That's not a name. So make it one. All right. Agent 47. Hitman is a game about control. 47 is one of the most dangerous people on the planet. He is the perfect assassin, able to blend seamlessly with the world around him. A master of seemingly every skill that someone can be a master of. He is utterly unstoppable, even by the efforts of the wealthiest, most powerful people in the world. Yet, through all of it, almost none of his actions are his own. I mean this in a few ways. Firstly, the obvious fact that you, as the player, control him. Your own skill at the game determines just how faultless and perfect an assassin he truly is. You decide how he moves, what he does, what he wears, whether he lives or dies. Very few of 47's actions are outside of your direct control. This is hardly atypical for video games, but I do think it's crucial to this game's themes. It's an idea these games come back to over and over again. For a similar example, all movies are, in some capacity, about watching, but a Brian De Palma movie is about watching. So, how else does the theme of control show up? Throughout most of the trilogy, 47's contracts are selected by Diana, his handler at the ICA, and then later by Lucas Gray and Olivia. 47 is frequently described as a tool or a weapon. He is an unthinking, uncaring object through which a person can more effectively further their goals. He doesn't really want anything, and so he effectively needs to be used by other characters in the story for any kind of narrative propulsion to happen. You can see then the parallels between the way he is controlled by the characters in the story and by the player. 47 is a means to an end. A tool for the characters to take down their opponents, and a tool for the players to experience the fantasy of being the world's best globe-trotting assassin. In talking about one of the game's disguises that 47 can use, the studio's creative director, Christian Elverdim, said, So obviously he can't become Helmut Kruger, right? Since he's not really anyone himself, it's easy for him to be everyone else. I think this is a really interesting idea, that 47's greatest strength is that blankness, that he can become anyone because he is no one. I also think it's plainly untrue. 47 is not a blank slate. He clearly has a personality. Belladonna? Isn't that poisonous? Yes. Should I be concerned? I'm not. Takes pride in his work. That sounds wonderful, Mr. Rangan. Can you look up a bit? And later comes to care about the people he works with. Christ, I think I killed one of them. Get out now before they spot you. No. They found us once. They'll find us again. <sighs> Keep your head down. I'll take care of this.
which makes the way he's so blatantly controlled by everyone around him all the more tragic. For all the skill and power available to 47, he is utterly at the mercy of everyone with authority over him. Breaking free of this is 47's arc throughout these three games, as he learns more about his past and starts to become his own person. In a lot of ways, 47 is the perfect video game protagonist. He is an empty vessel to be filled as the player sees fit. In his book, Video Game Storytelling, Evan Skolnick points out that antiheroes are particularly suited to the medium due to the high body counts players usually rack up over the course of a game. It alleviates some of that dissonance between character motivation and player motivation. The classic example would be someone like Nathan Drake from the Uncharted games, who in cutscenes is the classic rogue with a heart of gold, but under your control becomes a pathological murderer with a body count in the thousands. So I think the choice to add some depth to 47 is perhaps more risky than people give it credit for. It invites this dissidence, and only really works if the player is encouraged to play as the silent assassin, rather than gunning everyone down. There's a nice moment towards the end of Hitman 3, during the mission set in Chongqing, where 47 has a conversation with a woman who's worried about her friend. Hearing them talk, it struck me that we haven't seen 47 just chat to someone before. He doesn't have conversations with people that aren't about his work or some wry comments about the assassinations themselves. Large room with two easy to get to exits. Dark floors hide stains easily. A room with lots of potential. The player can, of course, just walk away and ignore this conversation entirely, but the game feels like it's pushing you to listen. This happens right at one of the starting points of the mission, the first part of the conversation playing out before you even have control of 47. Uh, have you seen a girl around? Uh, short hair with a bright green bag? Sorry. Shit. She said she'd meet me here. She's probably running late. Yeah. This sort of direction is usually reserved for pushing the player toward an opportunity to kill their target, or observe a particularly useful part of the level, but here it pushes you towards this conversation. One that is utterly mundane, and has nothing to do with your targets, or even the nature of the place that you're in. She used to be really reliable. When we were in school, she was my rock. She always let me copy her notes. She would never have kept me waiting like this. Sometimes it feels like she's changed. People change. It's stupid, but... I'm kind of scared she's outgoing me. David Bateson's iconic performance as Agent 47 is often and rightly praised for striking a difficult balance in tone. Both sardonic and sincere, aware of its own absurdity, but committed to its own seriousness. I think what gets less attention are moments like these, where that stoic, flat tone falters ever so slightly. Where some identifiable emotion slips into his delivery. Like maybe she's changing, but I'm just staying the same. I'm just, I don't know, dead weight. She agreed to meet you in the middle of the night, in the rain. No one does that if they don't care. I guess that's true. She even sets him up for a murder joke with that dead weight line, and he doesn't take it. If that's not character growth, I don't know what is. Oh, I feel like kind of an asshole for asking her out now. She's probably ruining her shoes in this weather, just so we can get drinks. Maybe you can pick up the tab. <laughs> that's a good idea. It is, well, subtle, and a clever way to indicate the beginnings of 47's change. No one told him to have this conversation. In fact, not even the player starts it. They simply choose not to stop it. I think it's especially telling that this mission ends with 47 destroying the ICA once and for all, leaking their files to the public and exposing their crimes for the world to see. 47 is no longer their weapon. This will shut the ICA down for good. You really okay with this? It's who you've been for so long. Maybe it's time. Throughout all three games, there are various mission stories that guide the player through a given level. These are contextualized as your handler, usually Diana, pointing out certain opportunities to 47 and walking him through how best to take advantage of them. According to our intel, Helmut Kruger is friendly with Dahlia Margolis, 
I suspect that Iago uses fashion models to infiltrate the lives of the rich and powerful, and Kruger is likely one of their spies. His face paint conveniently obscures his features, and the two of you already share a striking resemblance. Diana isn't around for most of the last game, however, leading to various characters taking up the mantle of 47's handler. In Berlin, there are no mission stories at all because 47 is surviving an ambush. He is the hunted, not the hunter, at least initially. In the last mission, despite not having a handler, there are still mission stories, and 47 himself points out these opportunities. A private tour of the estate. Diana, Vidal, and this fixer, Corvo Black. Black is a threat, but also an opportunity. I realize this probably isn't as effective if you haven't played the games yourself, but spending dozens of hours hearing Diana's voice every time you look over intel and mission stories to then suddenly hear 47's is impactful. It really works to hit home that things have changed, even if mechanically what you're doing hasn't. Although I do think 47 has an interesting arc in these games that works through the themes and ideas that the narrative explores, the true stars of any Hitman game are always going to be the targets. They are extravagant, cartoonishly evil, and just begging to meet some kind of ironic end. If 47's side of the story is about control, then the targets are about... Diana's philosophy in picking targets is the idea that no one is untouchable. It doesn't matter how powerful, connected, or wealthy a target might be, they'll die to 47 just the same way. I think it's easy to understand why I find that philosophy appealing. Inequality is becoming more and more pronounced, a fact that is particularly unavoidable during the pandemic. It seems like every other week there's a new story about how the unfathomably wealthy are making sure that they get wealthier, all while ignoring the problems that are driving us closer to literal extinction. And all of this is wrapped up in the knowledge that they aren't ever likely to face any consequences for it. I'm not angry about it, just exhausted. It's a particular kind of resigned helplessness with money and power pooling in the worst places and consolidating itself ad nauseum. Apathy is encouraged when it is so endlessly depressing to be empathetic, and all that does is make sure that everything that is happening will continue to happen. Life at the moment feels like a constant series of reminders that the world is terrible and there's nothing you can do about it. They're all untouchable. This last year has made these sorts of issues impossible to ignore for me, and I think it's relevant here because this is the context that I played Hitman 3 in. If you'd asked me a year ago what the core fantasy of the Hitman series was, I'd probably have pointed to the ways the games emulate the globe-trotting excitement of spy thrillers, the heists, the action, the excuse to step backstage and walk around where you're not supposed to. While all of that is true and just as engaging as it has always been, now the core feeling that drew me into the plot of Hitman 3 is catharsis. It's more than the usual video game release of seeing an objective resolved or advancing the story. It is being able to affect change against people who think they are above it. It is lashing out violently at a world that does not care about you and doesn't even deign to acknowledge your frustrations with it. Before I go any further, I want to be completely clear that I'm not advocating for violence against anyone. We can keep the guillotine in storage for now. As tempting as the idea might seem at times, 47's approach wouldn't fix any real problems, and arguably doesn't fix any in the games either, but we'll get to that. There will be no shortage of people to fill whatever gaps he might create. These issues are systemic and deeply complicated, far more complicated than the scope of this video can allow for, but they're key to why I find these games so compelling at the moment. The targets in the World of Assassination trilogy are universally despicable people, often cartoonishly so. At pretty much every conceivable level, they represent the worst of what humanity has to offer. 
They are the beating hearts of whatever depraved corruption they're involved in, and so their removal often excises that problem along with them. All targets are powerful. There are many different kinds of power, and even more expressions of it, but they all have some degree of influence and authority over the people around them. Targets tend to be either career criminals, people who have spent their entire lives devoted to crime, so think pirates or drug kingpins, or the wealthy elite, people in legitimate positions of power who then use that power for nefarious purposes. There is a whole range of reasons how these people got into these positions, from inherited fortunes to working up from the slums, but wealth and power are always constants. From a gameplay perspective, these targets seem like the obvious choice. They are the most powerful people in a given space, with the most security and the most eyes on them at all times. They are also most likely to be buried deep in some impenetrable fortress or working through very public events and spaces. They are people who believe they are untouchable, as does everyone around them. Too big to fail, too important to face any meaningful consequences. A feeling that, again, is intimately familiar to me. Of course they'll get away with it. Except you can make sure that they don't. No one is untouchable. I think the best way to understand what I'm talking about here is to work through an example. Let me get this straight, Mr. Stamberg. You are openly admitting to taking this money, the seven billion dollars from the Moroccan people? Why not? An opportunity presented itself, and I seized it. Again, all within the confines of the law. So, what should I apologize for? Hmm? Being a capitalist? <laughs> The third mission in the series sees 47 heading to Marrakesh, where the military is attempting to stage a coup against Morocco's fragile government. There are two targets in this mission, General Reza Zaydan and Klaus Hugo Strandberg, a bank CEO who stole billions from the Moroccan people. Before he could be put on trial for his crimes, he was broken out of prison and now hides in the Swedish consulate building as protesters gather in the streets below. Zaydan orchestrated the breakout in order to incite the people to riot, giving him an excuse to impose martial law and take over. This dynamic is expressed clearly in the level design, with the player directed towards the huge crowds protesting the consulate in front of the busy marketplace and the military working quietly in the background from an abandoned school. Strandberg is described as a sociopath, outwardly friendly and charismatic, but only interested in people insofar as they're capable of boosting his own wealth and power. Zaydan is similarly power-hungry, although he uses the power of the state to enact his desires rather than the privileged position that Strandberg's wealth affords him. Zaydan is a fairly uncomplicated monster. He comes from a line of wealthy, powerful people and wants that power legitimized by an office. Strandberg is a good deal more complicated, as is his relationship to the general public, with most people not knowing about Zaydan's involvement at all. Walking around, you can listen to what people say about Strandberg, a man who has brazenly stolen billions from their country. Seven billion! Seven billion, my friend! That is how much this psychophant from affluent Scandinavia has pilfered the citizens of Morocco. Naturally, they don't have anything particularly nice to say about him, but most interesting for my reading of the game, there is a pervasive sense that he's going to get away with it. There is a palpable frustration in the idea that someone can so comfortably hide behind money and status simply because they have it. Strandberg is a leech, but importantly, he's a leech that's sanctioned and approved by the powers around him. And what is our government doing to protect us from the white-collar predators like Claus Strandberg? I'll tell you what they're doing. They're doing what they do best. Nothing. One of the mission's opportunities sees 47 disguising himself as a cameraman for a film crew shooting an interview with Strandberg. Right. And you, aim and shoot. His whole argument revolves around the idea that he wasn't breaking the law, simply abusing a loophole within it. 
Well, I can only conclude that the Moroccan authorities must have misunderstood their own legislation. Misunderstood? How do you mean? None of those transactions were illegal. Everything was done in strict accordance with Moroccan law. Now, you might call it a loophole. You might call it creative bookkeeping. But the law is the law, Miss Kingsley, and I am a firm believer in the law. The obvious wrongness of this line of thinking speaks to the inherent flaws in the system that allows and encourages it. Again, Hitman is not a subtle game. Stramberg is an embodiment of everything wrong with capitalism. He exists as a result of it. If you don't like what he's doing, then, well, you shouldn't have let him do it. While Stramberg is obviously cartoonish here, as are your solutions to dealing with him, I think his monstrosity speaks clearly to the core fantasy of Hitman. Here is someone so clearly and confidently in the wrong, someone who is so smug and self-satisfied in the knowledge that he'll get away with everything he's done, who, even to the eyes of the people he's wronged, is untouchable. Except for you. So of course I want to drop a moose on his head, or throw him off a balcony, or snap his neck on a massage table. Ah, oh, this muscle tension is killing me. Hitman is structured around finding new and interesting ways to kill your targets over and over and over again. They need to be intimately hateable. They need to be the very worst of what humanity has to offer, and they need to give you that feeling of catharsis. While the plot of a Hitman game is an overly complex conspiracy web, its characters are incredibly simple, as are the solutions to the conflicts they create. Kill Strandberg and the world is a better place. Kill him over and over again in fun and exciting ways, and not only is the world a better place, but you feel better about it. But all this is a very hands-off way to think about a game like this. After all, games are an interactive medium, so how is this reflected in the core gameplay? For that, we need to take a look at disguises. You put on his clothes. <laughs> That's a first. Might just work, though. People do tend to see uniforms, not faces. One of the main ways you get around a level in a Hitman game is through disguises. Sneaking into a locker room and finding a waiter's outfit, or knocking out a guard and stealing his clothes to slip into a restricted area, are all core parts of the experience, so much so that the most difficult challenges in the game are to avoid using any disguises at all. In the vast majority of cases, your targets never suspect you when you're in a disguise. Why would the man pouring them a drink have any reason to hurt them? This adds to the sense of smug superiority that targets so frequently embody. They don't consider the people beneath them to be much of a threat, so the thought to question the jacked bald guy with a barcode tattooed on the back of his head never seems to cross their mind. This kind of thinking seems to apply to everyone who sees 47, their lines changing depending on what outfit you're wearing. Carry on, Private! Hey, I heard someone wants their check. The world of Hitman is entirely concerned with that surface level. If you look like a waiter, that is what you are, right down to your soul. Everything you do, every interaction you have is an extension of what you are wearing. This is what capitalism does to workers. It reduces you to the product itself. In exchange for the luxury of living your life, you become whatever it is that you do. Granted, this is hardly a story of the working class overthrowing their oppressors. 47 is, at the end of the day, in disguise. But it is a story about power, and at the very least one that adopts the aesthetics of revolution. A bartender poisoning their elitist scumbag of a boss is an image with baggage, intentional or otherwise. So the targets themselves are powerful, but nowhere near enough to deal with the unstoppable force that is Agent 47. So what's stopping him from just killing every bad person in the world? Surely the only real obstacle would be time. If it were that simple, then the themes of Hitman would boil down to rooting out a few bad apples rather than an acknowledgement of the systems that enable and support them. To answer this question, we need to look at the people behind the targets. We need to talk about Providence. Cheer up, Miss Burnwood. We... <sighs> we are the lesser evil. This terrorist... He wants nothing but chaos. 
He's only a terrorist if you win. Miss Birdwood, we won a long time ago. This, <laughs> this is maintenance. Providence are a quasi-mythical group that run the entire world from the shadows. Think Illuminati and lizard people conspiracies, and you're not too far away. They serve as the primary antagonists for most of the trilogy, with every target being connected to them in some way or another. They believe they know what's best for humanity, and use their considerable wealth and influence to enact these goals. It is revealed that the three controlling partners of Providence are the three wealthiest families in the world. They simply pooled their resources, and with this combined power, were able to enact change as they saw fit. I think this detail is telling that it was so incredibly simple for them to do this. All of the safeguards and democracies of the world meant absolutely nothing in the face of capitalist power. This is a series obsessed with ideas of power and control and understanding who makes the decisions and why. Its conclusion on all of that is incredibly simple. Money is power. Hitman is not a subtle game. Early on, Diana makes the point that the ICA is not political. This is a large part of her initial frustration with Providence, that they are using the ICA for their own political agendas when they see themselves as neutral. The irony here being that Providence also like to think of themselves as sort of a neutral good for the benefit of mankind. So often when I see people respond to these kinds of critiques of art, there is always the argument that it's just a movie or just a video game, the implication being that art cannot be political unless it is actively trying to be. The reality is that all art is political. It is all a product of the systems and people that produce it. It will replicate the ideology of its creation. Even a work of art that is actively trying to be apolitical is still taking a stance. The notes you don't play are as important as the ones you do. So I find it especially fascinating that Diana's arc in these games is essentially this realization that the ICA is not neutral, nor could it ever be. Neutrality is a political stance, being apolitical is an ideology, and by doing nothing you allow those with dangerous agendas to do as they please. This essay is already long enough as it is, so I'm not going to go too deep into the nature of art as politics. Jacob Geller has a really good video elaborating on some of these ideas in regards to the Call of Duty series, so I'd suggest you take a look at that if you're still interested in the idea. The head of Providence is known as the Constant. If his name wasn't enough of a giveaway, Providence represents the status quo, the constant state of things. In the world of Hitman, society as it exists has been shaped by this group to such an extent that the status quo is what Providence has willed it to be. This is what you're tasked with taking down. Providence are just as cartoonish as so many elements of Hitman are. They have a Bond villain secret base in the mountains. Philip Roche's performance as the Constant is only a few steps away from a full-on Agent Smith impersonation. <laughs> and they have yearly meetings where they all wear robes and masks and burn a giant pile of money. But that bluntness is key. This is what the game has to say about the 1% about the people who control our lives without our consent, who decide what the future holds and make these choices based on what benefits them personally most at the moment. The Isle of Scale is the final mission in Hitman 2, and it sees 47 infiltrating a Providence gathering, this one specifically geared towards preparing for the end of the world. Members can purchase space in secret survival bunkers that will open exclusively to them when the effects of climate change that they are worsening grow to be too much. I think this detail feels almost prescient now as billionaires like Elon Musk are pushing for space travel and the colonization of other planets while we systematically destroy our own. There is an important meeting between key Providence members on the island where they vote to pivot towards renewable energy as they have drained all that they possibly could from fossil fuels. 47 can attend this meeting disguised as the one vote currently holding out. Obviously the world's energy CEOs don't sit around in eyes wide shut masks to discuss the future of their business, 
but they absolutely do fund think tanks and studies to further the lies, misunderstanding, and misinformation about climate change for their own personal benefit. Similarly, this meeting is a purely practical one. It is not a reckoning with the damage they've caused, but an acceptance that the well has been drained and they need to move on to the next one in order to stay on top. You can listen in on a conversation between one of the energy CEOs and the constant. The CEO talks about how it doesn't matter if the world falls apart due to climate change because he has a place in one of those aforementioned secret survival bunkers. Say the world does collapse. The weather goes haywire, the poles melt, and the Ark Society heads off to a comfortable Arctic sanctuary while the rest of civilization falls into chaos. That's about the gist of it. Sounds great to me. No more needy assholes. Why wait? Well... You do realize what kind of place it'll be, right? What are you talking about? A hundred or so people? No market, no economy, no social structures. It will be like a space colony. Everyone equal and dependent on each other. It will be egalitarian, sir. It will be, well, Communist, my God. That's what I paid almost two billion for? Why didn't anyone tell me sooner? Merely food for thought, Mr. Block. The end of the world means nothing to him. In fact, he seems to actively be looking forward to it. But the end of capitalism? That's a horror he can barely seem to comprehend. Hitman is not a subtle game. Although I think the game goes to pretty extensive lengths to avoid assigning a particular political leaning to Providence, they are overtly and specifically a critique of the extremes of modern capitalism. They represent the dangers of complacency with the status quo, the assumption that nothing can change, necessarily meaning that nothing will. Providence doesn't believe in anything. The only thing that matters to them is power. They have no moral stake in this, no concern for the future beyond the personal. So while I'm sure the reality is much more mundane, maybe billionaires should wear evil robes and meet on a deserted island at sea. It might at least be a bit more honest. I choose this path because I can. There will always be people like them. So there will always be people like us. No one is untouchable. It's good to be back. In the series' final mission, you can overhear various conversations from people discussing the 1% murders, the name given to what you've been doing over the last three games. Although there is some fear that they might be next, most of the Providence members are remarking on what came next. One monster replaces another, and for all of 47's superhuman abilities, he effectively has changed very little. I think this idea comes too late in the game to be truly effective. The fact that your actions haven't changed all that much is brought up and resolved within one mission. It's really just there to motivate you to take out the constant and give some context to Diana's subsequent actions. The game ends with Diana assuming the position of constant and pulling Providence apart from the inside. The implication here is that to enact systemic change, one needs to work from within the system. Despite being effective from moment to moment, Diana and 47's violent approach failed. Their revolution would not have worked. I think, again, this idea is a little undercooked. You spend almost three full games being very successful, only for the last mission to point out that it wasn't really all that effective. I get the impression that the writers back themselves into a corner here, in that the only option aside from taking down the system from the inside would be a complete deconstruction of capitalism, and I doubt they'd be willing to go that far. I'm also not a huge fan of how it concludes 47's arc, the whole narrative seems to be building to this idea that 47 is his own man now, not controlled by Diana or Lucas or the ICA or Providence. But he ends pretty much exactly where he started again, in the snow, with Diana telling him there's another mission for them both to take up. 
47 has undoubtedly changed by this point, but it feels far less meaningful given that he's back exactly where he was. I think there are interesting ideas in the way this story wraps up, but I wish it had begun to work through them from the start and been more consistent about the ways in which its characters develop. This is most likely a consequence of how the story was told, across three separate games, the first of which was released in episodic chunks. The first game's pace is almost glacial by comparison to the third, which feels like it's trying to give half a dozen different climaxes to plot points set up in the other two. There is a lot here, and if I'm being perfectly honest, not all of it works. I understand why so many dismiss the plots of these games out of hand, why I can find so many discussions of their intricate level design and systems, and so little on what the games are ostensibly about. My problems with the ending and the uneven pace aside, I think Hitman's writing is vastly underappreciated, in terms of its moment-to-moment dialogue, the overarching themes of its ideas and its plot, and the arcs of its characters. And I think most importantly of all, it's the right game at the right time. It works through a lot of difficult to express, complicated frustrations with the world at large, all while being one of the best stealth games ever made. It is a genuine masterpiece, not only for all the things I mentioned here, but for the dozens of things I couldn't fit in. It is methodically constructed, masterfully executed, and beautifully blunt. (laughs) 